There are many parameters that need to be specified in order for us to have CT images to look at that can accurately answer clinical questions. We can divide these parameters into two major buckets. Scanning parameters that must be specified before we radiate the patient in the CT machine, and presentation parameters after we've radiated the patient in the machine that specify how to convert the raw data from the scan into acceptable images for radiologists to interpret. Because scanning parameters are established before we scan our patient, if we're not happy with them and want to change them but have already scanned the patient, we need to bring the patient back and rescan them. On the other hand, we can play around and readjust presentation parameters all we like after the fact without having to rescan our patient. Scanning and presentation parameters are both important because they influence two very important things when it comes to CT imaging, image quality and the radiation dose we subject our patient to in order to create their CT images. There's another topic that I'd like to include with this talk, and that's going to be the use of contrast media in CT imaging, both intravenous and oral. So there's going to be five items I'll tackle in this talk, beginning with scanning parameters. But before I begin talking about scanning parameters, I think it's important to talk about how old incandescent light bulbs work for just a moment, because if you can understand how an incandescent light bulb works, you understand how an x-ray tube works too. With incandescent light bulbs, we send electricity across a thin metal filament housed in a glass container. That electricity heats up the metal filament and photons get emitted from the super hot metal filament. X-ray tubes work in just the same way. The only differences are that the photons that get emitted by the filament are of a different wavelength, the filament design is much more heavy duty, and the glass container just happens to have a different shape. With incandescent light bulbs, manipulating the electricity we send across the filament allows us to change how bright the light bulb is and the color of light it gives off. We can manipulate how bright a light bulb is by changing the current of the electricity we send across its filament. Current refers to the number of electrons we send across the filament every second. If electrons were water molecules, a low current state might be like the flow of water in a small stream, while a high current um, situation would be like the flow of water um, in the mighty Mississippi River. Low electric current across the filament of a light bulb results in a smaller number of photons being emitted and a dimmer light, while high electric current across the filament of a light bulb results in a larger number of photons being emitted and a much brighter light. We can manipulate the color of the light from a light bulb by changing the voltage drop between both ends of the filament. Voltage drop refers to the difference in electric potential between the ends of the filament. It's basically how hard each electron is being pushed across the filament. If the electrons were water molecules, a low voltage situation might be like water flow in the Nile River, while a high voltage situation would be like a water molecule flowing over Niagara Falls. While the number of total water molecules flowing past a point every second might be about the same in either situation, water molecules flowing over Niagara Falls see a lot more potential difference or push. Low voltage across the filament of a light bulb creates photons that each carry less energy and appear warmer and more orange in color while high voltage across the filament of a light bulb creates photons that each carry more energy and appear cooler and whiter or bluer in color. Now that we have that out of the way, there's gonna be seven scanning parameters I want you to be familiar with. Tube current, Gantry rotation time, peak tube voltage or kilovoltage peak, that's KVP, field of view, coverage, acquisition mode, and pitch. In daily use, the first two scanning parameters, tube current and gantry rotation time, are often linked and referred to by their product, tube current time product, or by its units, milliampere seconds or milliamps, or MAS. Expert tube current, expressed in units of milliamps or MA, influences the number of X-ray photons coming out of our X-ray tube. The more tube current, or MA, the more X-ray photons we shoot at the patient in our CT machine. It's important that we shoot enough X-ray photons at our patient because if not enough X-ray pho photons pass through our patient and reach the detector on the other side, we won't have enough photons to create an image. However, if we shoot too many X-ray photons at our patient, 
will create a picture, but also possibly give our patient an unhealthily high amount of radiation exposure. Gantry rotation time is the amount of time it takes for the x-ray tube to revolve once around the patient. The shorter the gantry rotation time, the faster the tube completes one revolution, which can reduce scan times and reduce motion artifact. But this comes at the cost of more image noise, partly because we're spending less time radiating any particular part of the patient's body and therefore imaging it with fewer x-ray photons. And this also comes at the cost of more streak artifacts too. So as long as the body part we're imaging is relatively fixed, slower tube rotation, which means a longer gantry rotation time, will result in better image quality. Important for imaging fine structures like the inner air and the temporal bone. X-ray tube current and gantry rotation time are often linked and referred to by their product, which we call the tube current time product, or by its units, MAS, for milliamp seconds. MAS is an expression that effectively quantifies the amount of radiation produced by the X-ray tube during one rotation of the gantry. Increase the MAS and you're effectively increasing the amount of X-ray photons you're shooting at your patient. Peak tube voltage, or KVP, influences the energy each individual X-ray photon coming out of the tube packs. The higher the KVP, the more energy you package in each X-ray photon you shoot at your patient. We want the amount of energy each X-ray photon packs to be just right. Too little energy, and the X-ray photons don't make it through our patient. If not enough photons make it through our patient, not enough photons will hit the detector. And if you don't have enough photons to hit the hitting the detector, you're not gonna be able to make an image. With too much energy, your detector may collect lots of photons to make an image, but the relative ability of different materials to block x-rays, like say water versus muscle, ends up being not that different. If each photon packs too much energy, image contrast and your ability to visually distinguish between different tissue types suffers. The acquisition or scan field of view, abbreviated as AFOV or SFOV, is the largest region of space you can create a CT image of after you rotate the x-ray tube and gantry around your patient. It's influenced by the fan angle of the x-ray beam coming out of the x-ray tube. A typical acquisition field of view for an abdominal CT is 50 centimeters and 25 centimeters for smaller body parts like maybe the head. Practically speaking, the actual images we look at and, and uh, interpret on PACS are usually images with a smaller field of view than the acquisition field of view. And we refer to that as the reconstruction or display field of view, or abbreviated as RFOV or DFOV. If your CT image is say 512 by 512 pixels, it makes sense not to waste pixels painting all of the air outside of the patient's body, but invest most of them painting the anatomy of interest. More pixels used on the anatomy of interest means a little better spatial resolution for what you really care about. That's why DFOVs for cardiac imaging may be much, much smaller than for routine chest CT, just so that you can get a, a few more pixels to paint every coronary artery just a little bit more detailed. You can do a rough calculation of the effect of DFOV on spatial resolution. Let's say um, our CT image is a 512 by 512 pixel grid, and the DFOV is 200 millimeters. 200 millimeters divided by 512 pixels mean that every pixel represents 0.4 millimeters. Now, let's say your DFOV is 100 millimeters. 100 millimeters divided by 512 pixels means that every pixel can now represent 0.2 instead of 0.4 millimeters. Coverage refers to where and how much of the body in the cranial direction, cranial caudal direction we're scanning, and it's specified by the start and end locations of the scan. The start and end locations will define one zone for an abdominal CT and perhaps a different one for a chest CT. Your start and end points will define the direction of the scan, either from inferior to superior or superior to inferior. I think it's good to be familiar with what the coverage of most common CT scans are. For example, with head CTs, the patient's positioned with their arms down, 
Using the scout topogram, the tech will plan a scan that begins at the C2 vertebra and ends at the vertex of the skull, scanning from inferior to superior. For CTs of the neck, the arms of the patient are also lowered, and the tech performs a CT scan from the tips of the ears to the heads of the clavicles, if it's a cervical spine CT, and from the tips of the ears to just below the aortic arch, if it's a soft tissue neck CT. For CTs of the chest, we raise the arms of the patient, and the tech performs a CT scan from just above the heads of the first ribs and lung apices to just below the lateral costophrenic angles. For CTs of the abdomen only, the arms of the patient are raised, and the tech performs a CT scan from just above the domes of the diaphragm to the anterior superior iliac spines, if it's a standard abdominal CT, and the tech performs a CT scan from just above the upper poles of the kidneys to the anterior superior iliac spines, if it's a renal stone protocol abdominal CT. For CT pelvises of the pelvis only, um, CT scans of the pelvis only, the arms of the patients are raised, and the tech performs a CT scan from just above the iliac crest to just below the ischia. For CT scans of the abdomen and pelvis, the arms of the patient are raised, and the, CT, and the CT tech performs a scan from just above the domes of the diaphragm to the ischia, if it's a standard abdominal CT, and they perform a scan from just above the kidneys to the ischia, if it's a urinary tract calculus CT study. The acquisition mode refers to how the CT volume will be captured while you're scanning from the start point to the end point. One option is an axial or step and shoot um, acquisition, which is the way the earliest CT scans were acquired. The tube turns on and a Ganshi rotation occurs at one spot. The tube moves in an increment and then another, and then the tube turns on again and a Ganshi rotation again occurs at a different spot. And the process continues until you've enmeshed the entire region you wanted to cover. The other option is a helical or spiral acquisition, which is the way most CT scans are acquired today. The tube turns on and remains on as the gantry constantly rotates while the table smoothly moves from the start to the end point. With this sort of acquisition, you can envision how the x-ray tube paints a tight continuous spiral rather than a tight stack of circles. The tube turns on and remains on, and um, we paint this spiral. Pitch is a term used with regards to helical acquisition CTs that basically um, describes how tight that spiral we, we paint is. The definition for a single slice CT, the pitch of a single slice, um, the definition for pitch for a single detector CT. Um, is relatively easy to um, grasp. It's the distance the table travels during one Gantt rotation divided by the thickness of the X-ray beam. For multi-detector CTs, um, pitch is defined as the distance the table travels during one Gantt rotation divided by the total thickness of all the acquired um, kind of slices um, done simultaneously by one rotation of that multi-detector CT. Presentation parameters um, are parameters that define the character of the images the, um, of the patient we create from the raw data acquired by our machine after the scan's been performed. There are six presentation parameters that I'd like you to be familiar with. The reconstruction algorithm, the convolution algorithm or kernel, the image slice thickness, the image slice interval, the window width, and the window level. Reconstruction algorithms are basically all the math that's done to convert the raw data obtained by our CT machine into anatomical images we can actually look at and interpret. There are two basic strategies to do this math, filtered back projection and iterative reconstruction. Filtered back projection is a strategy that's been commercially available since the 1970s, while iterative reconstruction is a newer strategy that's been commercially available only since 2009 that offers benefits over filtered back projection but require a lot more computing power to do. The best way to appreciate the differences between filtered back projection and iterative reconstruction is to use an analogy. And the analogy I like to use is Google Translate. I think of doing filtered back projection like doing a single one-way translation of an English phrase into a Spanish translation, which as anyone who's used Google Translate knows, is pretty good, but can sometimes be slightly inaccurate, especially if you're using slang. 
On the other hand, doing iterative reconstruction would be like doing a translation from English to Spanish and then taking the Spanish output and translating it back to English again to see if you got out what you originally put in and then repeating that cycle a couple more times. You can imagine this would take more work than the first method, but might result in a more accurate translation. In summary, a filtered back projection is a more traditional reconstruction algorithm that has more modest computational demands, but is also more susceptible to problems like image noise and streak artifacts. While iterative reconstruction requires a lot more computing power, but is much better at overcoming image noise and streak artifact problems. Some chess radiologists wonder if a little bit of real imaging um, information might be suppressed along with image noise with iterative reconstruction, but the amount, if any, we believe is probably pretty minimal. Here's an example of the difference between the same raw data reconstructed using filtered back projection versus iterative reconstruction, all other factors being equal. It's a small difference, but you might notice that the iterative reconstruction image is a little less noisy than the filtered back projection image. You can probably see why you could create an image of equivalent quality as filtered back projection is using less radiation, that is less X-ray photons, using iterative reconstruction um, to convert raw data into images. Convolution uh, algorithms or kernels are different than reconstruction algorithms. Kernels um, allow us to control the trade-off between information and noise in the raw data itself that we feed into the reconstruction algorithm. Soft kernels result in a ultimately smoother, less noisy image, um, but they also tend to blur anatomic interfaces a little. While sharp kernels um, result in sharper appearing images that also tend to be a little bit more noisy. We generally prefer sharp kernel images when uh, looking at lung parenchyma, and soft kernel images when looking at um, things like solid organs. Although a CT image slice seems like a purely two-dimensional construct, it's actually a representation of a three-dimensional slab that just happens to be very, very thin. Any body part we do a CT of is presented as a contigu contiguous stack of images that each represent a slab or slice of tissue of a specific thickness. The distance between each contiguous slab or slice is the slice interval. Sometimes the slice thickness and interval may be thin, and sometimes it might be thick. Most of the time, the slice thickness and slice interval are the same. However, the slice thickness and slice interval don't always have to be the same. If you want uh, each slice to overlap the next one by 50%, uh, you can set the slice interval to be half the slice thickness, which would result in a much smoother scrolling animation when you scroll in packs, and also perhaps allow you to reformat your axial images into kernel or sagittal images with less jagginess. We can also set the slice interval to be greater than the slice thickness too. We do this um, explicitly when we do expiratory phase CT um, chest images um, after we've already done the standard inspiratory phase acquisition. On non-contiguous expiratory um, CT imaging, we're just looking for big picture changes and don't need to re-radiate 100% of the CT of the patient's um, anatomy again, uh, since we already have a complete inspiratory phase acquisition of the patient's anatomy. Um, every CT image is an image map that tells us how much every tiny focus of soft tissue corresponding to each individual pixel is able to block X-rays. The ability to block X-rays is called CT attenuation and expressed in units called Hounsfield units. The Hounsfield unit scale is anchored at minus 1,000 for air and zero for water. CT images are usually displayed as a grayscale image where black is anchored at one Hounsfield unit value and white is anchored at another. And any Hounsfield unit um, value in between is represented as varying levels of gray. If most human eyes can only discern about 30 levels of gray between white and black, and the difference between pathologic and normal tissue can sometimes be as small as 15 to 20 Hounsfield units, you can see how a grayscale spectrum like the one on this particular slide with black anchored at minus 1,000 and white anchored at positive 1,000 could be a problem. If you happen to know that the tissue of interest was in the vicinity of, say, 500 Hounsfield units, you could solve this problem by anchoring black at 400 and white at 600 and investing 
all of your grayscale, grayscale spectrum over a much, much narrower range so that you could visually resolve a 15 to 20 Hounsfield unit difference. Because 400 um, Hounsfield units is already anchored as black, you happen to paint everything from minus 1,000 to 400 as black um, too in this scenario. Since 600 Hounsfield units is already anchored at white, all values above 600 would have to be painted as white too. Um, you do this, um, you paint everything before below 400 as pure black and everything above um, 600 as pure white. In other words, uh, the cost of being able to resolve small changes in CT attenuation in the vicinity of 500 Hounsfield field units comes at the cost of being able to um, resolve attenuation differences in ranges below 400 and above 600. So if you're interested in looking at a different organ where the CT attenuation was, say, in the vicinity of minus 250 Hounsfield units, you would need to change the grayscale spectrum to something like this instead. We refer to a grayscale spectrum as a window and describe the range of Hounsfield units covered um, by the dynamic range of the grayscale spectrum as the window width, um, which happens to be two hounds, 200 Hounsfield units in this particular example here. When radiologists speak of wide windows, we're usually talking about window widths of above 500, 500 Hounsfield units, while narrow windows are usually no more than 300 Hounsfield units. Wide windows are used for looking at organs that have a wide range of attenuation values, like the lung, while narrow windows are used for looking at organs that have a more narrow range of attenuation values, like the liver. We refer to the value at which the midpoint of the grayscale spectrum is positioned as the window level, which can also be called the window center. The midpoint of the 200 Hounsfield unit spectrum on this slide sits at 500. So the window level in this example is 500. The typical combinations of window width and level um, radiologists use to study different organs varies. Um, for lung, we generally prefer a wide 1,000 um, Hounsfield unit window centered at around minus 700, which creates a grayscale spectrum assignment that causes a CT image to look like this. On the other hand, we generally prefer a more narrow 400 Hounsfield unit window centered at around 40 for looking at solid organs which creates a grayscale spectrum assignment that causes a CT image to look like this. Notice that since most of the pixels in the lung have average attenuation values between minus 1000 and minus 160, most of the lungs painted are most of the lungs are painted in pure black on a soft tissue window like this. And all the subtle anatomy we were previously able to see with the lung window has now become invisible to us. For bones, we generally prefer a wide 2000 Hounsfield unit window centered at around 350, which creates a grayscale spectrum assignment that causes a CT image to look like this. Now, we've gone over many technical factors that control how a CT scan is performed and how the CT images are presented after the scan. However, all of these technical factors are not an ends, but the means to an end. And the ends are ultimately having images of sufficient quality to us to allow us to make diagnoses and ensuring safe radiation dose exposures um, to our patients. At the end of the day, image quality is what determines if we can fulfill our clinical duty to our patients. In technical terms, it's whether our image shows enough detail for us to resolve the object we're looking for, whether our image has enough contrast for us to distinguish the object itself from the background, and if the amount of image noise is acceptably low. Random image noise can undermine spatial resolution and image contrast. With CT imaging, the more X-ray photons we use, that is, the more radiation we subject our patient to, the better the image quality generally will be. That means that in radiology, we're constantly try um, trying to strike the right balance between image quality and radiation dose. And the levers uh, we use to influence and adjust this balance are many of the scanning and presentation parameters we just reviewed. Increasing X-ray tube current allows us to improve image quality by decreasing image noise by a factor of around 1.4. However, it comes at the cost of a proportional increase in radiation dose to our patient. 
Increasing gantry rotation time, that is making the gantry rotate slower, can improve image quality by decreasing image noise, but can also worsen image quality by increasing motion blur sometimes. Higher gantry rotation times also come at the cost of a proportional increase in radiation dose to our patient. While increasing X-ray tube peak voltage improves image quality by decreasing image noise, it can also worsen image quality by decreasing soft tissue contrast. Increasing X-ray tube peak voltage also comes with another hefty price. The radiation, the radiation dose to our patient increases by 2.6 power. Reconstructing CT images at higher um, slice thickness can improve image quality by decreasing noise, since more photons effectively go into creating each image we view. At fixed image noise, thicker slices also therefore permit us to get away with using less radiation on our patient. However, thick image slices do come at a cost of lower spatial resolution. Finally, increasing the pitch of our helical CT acquisition, that is sending the table through the gantry much faster, can inc increases image noise, but decreases radiation dose to the patient. So if you look at this entire table, you can see how arriving at optimal values for each CT parameter is a delicate dance. A dance often with different answers for different scenarios. Now, a few practical points with these parameters. Your CT tech will usually manipulate the tube current time product or MAS value from patient to patient, decreasing it in patients who are smaller than average. Tube current modulation, um, well, that's a technology that's built into most recent CT machines, which helps us keep radiation doses down. In the old days, tube current was a fixed value during the duration, the entire duration of a scan, um, usually set by the amount of current needed to image the thickest part of the patient's body. With tube current modulation, the tube current can go up or down during the scan, depending on what part of the body is in the gantry at any given point in time. Faster gantry rotation times reduce motion blur, and to give you a number to kind of wrap your head around, the fastest CT gantry rotation times are currently in the vicinity of around a third of a second. As a radiologist, we sometimes adjust KVP on a per patient basis. In larger patients, we'll increase the KVP in order to get enough photons to the detector to create an image, though we do this with the knowledge that soft tissue contrast will suffer a little on the images we do create. On the other hand, if image quality is paramount, let's say um, on a coronary CTA, we may decrease the KVP in some patients in order to squeeze out just a little more image contrast. Be aware that many CT machines will automatically decrease the MAS if you increase KVP in order to moderate the radiation dose to your patient. So we've been talking a lot about radiation dose to our patients. Um, how do we quantify it? It's not, as with, it's not as if uh, we can embed a dosimeter deep inside every patient's body before they hop on a CT machine. Well, it turns out we use two pretty crude numbers to estimate at least the radiation dose to our patients. The first is a value called the Volume CT Dose Index, or CTDI vol. The CTDI vol is absorbed radiation dose um, a, a acrylic phantom receives when you scan that acrylic phantom with a particular CT protocol. For example, say an ILD protocol for a medium-sized patient. So for a given CT machine and a given protocol, CTDI vol is a fixed value independent of a patient and independent of how long the scan is in the Z or cranial caudal axis. Because CTDI vol is independent of the person, of the patient, it will overestimate the effective radiation larger patients receive since large people tend to have a lot of subcutaneous fat that can absorb a lot of the radiation before it can reach an internal organ. Since CTDI vol is independent of cranial caudal scan lymph, it will overestimate the effective radiation shorter patients received since they'll get a shorter than average CT scan. We can slightly account for that issue um, this, the, the issue of short versus long patients, or short versus tall patients, um, by using a second value called the dose length product, or DLP. The DLP is just the CTDI vol multiplied by the length of the scan in the Z axis. 
uh, since the units of CTDI vol are milligrays, the units of DLP are milligray centimeters. Now let's discuss intravenous contrast. First and foremost, be familiar with what the indications for intravenous contrast are for each body part, since this tends to be a common question you get on the phone when you're on call. If it's safe to administer, we prefer IV contrast for head CTs done for masses, aneurysms, and infection. Because fresh blood is also hyperattenuating, just like intravenous contrast, we generally avoid IV contrast in head CTs done for acute stroke, acute headaches, and neurological changes, um, and also for suspected intracranial bleeds and trauma. Intravenous contrast is generally preferred for all neck CTs. In the chest, we generally prefer IV contrast for indications like trauma, hemoptysis, esophageal malignancy, pleural malignancy, and invasive lung cancer workups. In addition to uh, vascular studies like PEs and aortas, we also like IV contrast when imaging immunosuppressed patients. IV contrast is generally unnecessary though for lung nodule work and ILD work. Intravenous contrast is generally preferred for all abdominal pelvic CTs except for studies for urinary tract calculi. Be familiar with what the adverse outcomes of IV contrast use might be. The two biggies are allergic reactions and acute renal failure. Here's a relatively comprehensive list of different allergic reactions you may encounter in patients getting IV contrast, organized by severity. Be very careful about reactions in the severe list, like cardiopulmonary arrest, seizure, loss of consciousness, laryngeal edema, hypotension, hypertensive crisis, and arrhythmia since these tend to be absolute contraindications for administering IV contrast in the future, even with premedication. When planning IV contrast administration, in addition to talking to the patient, it's important to review their medical record, taking note not only of the presence of a prior IV contrast allergic reaction, but also the symptoms and severity. In patients with a history of non-severe IV contrast allergic reaction, um, a common prep uh, is three doses of oral steroid, 13, 7, and 1 hour before the scan, in addition to Benadryl 1 hour before the scan. When planning IV conscious administration, it's also important to be on the lookout to see if your patient has risk factors for conscious nephropathy, um, like CKD, diabetes, heart failure, old age, and a history of recently receiving a large slug of IV contrast, especially the high osmolar ones. The estimated GFR is your final check, and we'll usually be very cautious about using IV contrast in patients whose um, eGFRs are below 30. Aspiration pneumonia is an important secondary adverse outcome that could occur if your patient's allergic reaction is vomiting. And that's why we usually prefer that patients are at least MPO for two hours before their CT so that their stomach isn't full. Metabolic acidosis is another important secondary adverse outcome that could occur if your patient is using metformin um, and develop a contrast nephropathy. Since metformin is excreted by the kidneys, it can accumulate in the bloodstream, uh, leading to metabolic acidosis if uh, acute renal failure were to develop after an IV contrast exposure. And that's why we ask patients to hold their metformin, if they're on it, for 48 hours after their CT. If conscious nephropathy were to occur, it would typically have um, happened within that 48-hour window. On the subject of IV contrast, another popular question folks will often ask you is, uh, when you're on call, uh, whether the peripheral IV their patient currently has can be used for whatever study they're asking for. Know the most common peripheral IV gauges, 16, 18, 20, and 22, and their standard color. Gray for 16 gauge, green for 18 gauge, pink for 20 gauge, and blue for 22 gauge. Solving for Poiseuille's equation in the right column here gives you an appreciation for just how much I, uh, more IV contrast you can inject when you move up to the next wider IV size. Coronary CTAs require the highest IV contrast injection rates and we usually insist on 16 or 18 gauge IVs. For CTAs of other body parts, we prefer 18 or 20 gauge IVs. Um, as for standard non-angiographic um, contrast-enhanced uh, contrast CT studies, um, IVs as small as 20 and 22 gauge are usually okay. In addition to uh, injecting contrast through uh, peripheral IVs, we can sometimes administer IV contrast through special power injectable picks. 
Hickman catheters, and chest ports. Power injectable picks in Hickmans are usually cleanly, clearly labeled as injectable with a maximum flow rate value and are usually purple in color. As for chest ports, power injectable chest ports can be recognized on a chest x-ray. Look for the letters CT um, somewhere in the design of the um, um, chest port. In the two examples on this slide, um, the port in the upper image is not injectable, while the port in the lower image, image with the letters CT is injectable. The volumes of contrast we use can vary depending on what we're scanning. IV contrast volumes for routine enhanced neck and chest CTs may be around 60 to 80 milliliters, while IV contrast volumes for a head CT uh, may be slightly more, like 80 to 100 milliliters. For abdominal CTs, we may use around 100 to 120 millimeter, milliliters of IV contrast, while for CT angiograms, we may use up to 120 to 140 milliliters of IV contrast. The time delay between IV contrast injection and CT scanning will vary depending on what body part you're imaging and how and what kind of study you're doing. CT angiogram studies of arterial structures require the shortest and most carefully timed delays. Since the appropriate delay can vary a lot from one patient to another, sometimes because of, say, different um, uh, left ventricular um, uh, ejection fractions and stuff, uh, we'll rely on a technique called bolus tracking to get the timing just right for these kind of studies. With bolus tracking, we basically park the patient in the gantry and scan the same position over and over and over again every second after we start the IV contrast injection. On each scan, we'll measure the attenuation value of an ROI in a vascular structure of interest, like the pulmonary artery in this example here. And once the vessel reaches a target value of enhancement, say maybe 200 Hounsfield units, the scanning process will be triggered. ROIs for CTAs of the head and neck are usually placed in the aortic arch, while ROIs in CTAs of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis may be placed in the aortic arch or descending thoracic aorta at the level of the carina. For PE studies, we may put the ROI in the pulmonary artery at the level of the carina or in the right ventricle. For CTAs of the abdomen, the ROI will be placed in the aorta, two slices above the celiac artery. And for CTAs of the pelvis and lower extremities, we'll place the ROI at the aortic bifurcation. For a PE study, we generally do bolus tracking and then add a fixed 20 second um, additional delay. Um, uh, delays for routine enhanced CT studies are more standard um, across different, image, uh, different patient types and usually don't require bolus tracking. For chest CTs and neck CTs, we used a fixed delay of uh, 30 and 45 seconds, respectively. For routine abdominal CTs, we'll use a fixed delay of 70 seconds. Delays for CT venograms of the chest can range from 60 to 110 seconds, while for CT venograms of the abdomen, we may wait as long as two to three minutes. Um, delays for enhanced head CTs are very long and can last as much as 10 minutes. It's often necessary to also it's also um, sometimes necessary to obtain enhanced imaging at multiple points in time for um, um, organs like the liver or kidney. The timing of the arterial phase images for these organs is usually assigned by bolus tracking, with anteric phase imaging occurring 25 seconds after the arterial phase, portal venous phase imaging occurring 70 seconds after the arterial phase, and nephrographic phase imaging occurring 100 seconds after the arterial phase. The kidneys need to have enough time to begin filtering IV contrast out of the bloodstream if we're to study the urinary tract, and excretory phase CT images will usually require delays in the vicinity of around five minutes. We'll finish now with a short discussion on enteric contrast. Enteric contrast is helpful when we're reading abdominal CTs since having contrast in the bowel lumen makes it much easier for us to distinguish soft tissue masses, particularly uh, lower attenuation ones from fluid-filled bowel. Water-soluble enteric contrast is also useful um, if we're looking for the presence of uh, presence or site of a leak in the GI tract. There are two main categories of enteric contrast we use during CT imaging, um, barium-based agents and iodine-based agents. Redicat is an example of a barium-based agent, while gastrographin and enteric omnipeg are examples of iodine-based agents. Iodine-based agents are water-soluble. Barium-based agents like Redicat provide nice bowel lumen opacification 
and are associated with fewer uh, re allergic reactions. However, they taste chalky and can cause mediastinitis or peritonitis um, if administered to patients with a GI leak. Iodine-based agents like gastrographin and uh, enteric omnipake are safe in the setting of bowel perforation and have fast transit times, though they can trigger capillary leak pulmonary edema if accidentally aspirated. Gastrographin has a bitter taste, while enteric omnipake is more palatable, though also more costly. The amount of iodine-based enteric contrast administered is usually weight-based, while we usually give the same amount of barium-based enteric contrast to everyone.